Hey, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you, depending on when you've tuned in to this edition of Hypnosis Week Live. Uh, welcome to those on YouTube and Vimeo and other video platforms, and also to uh, anyone listening to the audio podcast as well. You're very welcome indeed. Check out the past editions uh, below. And also below this video or audio, as always, you will find all the links to the social media profiles and websites of this week's guest a gentleman who's been a friend of mine for a number of years and uh, we've been out socializing together uh, i've seen him perform um and he is pretty much I'm, i was going to say arguably then but pretty much based on uh, i do you know have my ear to the ground so to speak he is in england one of the busiest um i'm gonna say no offence to anyone, but proper stage hypnotist in the sense of <laughs> people who are not going out for $100 a night or 100 quid. And those of you who've taken a sharp intake of breath, especially uh, guys and girls in America and some other places, yes, there are people in England going out for less than um, 100 quid sterling, so for a less, just under $100. Uh, no wonder it's getting harder to get work. So please welcome to the show, comedy stage hypnotist. Um, I'm going to find out, not spoke to him too much about this, but I have seen him that he has done some hypnotherapy as well. We'll go more into that. And uh, he has got a whole bunch of other business interests as well that I'm aware of. So we're going to explore the mind of Mr. Grant Saunders. Welcome to the show, Grant. Hey, thank you for having me on. It's, uh, especially in these unusual times that we're in at the moment now. So Yeah, yeah we've got to stress, if you're finding this is weeks, months or years to come, we're uh, doing this on the 27th of May 2020 during the COVID coronavirus lockdown, which fortunately is always starting to get yeah. eased. Hence, yeah. hence the beard and the, the terrible hair. <laughs> hey, I've seen worse. Oh, it's ridiculous at the moment. I'm not. I'm not. I, I didn't consider myself a vain person, um, but I've, I've never realised how much I appreciate my hairdresser at this moment in time. So yeah. <laughs> First thing before going back to the intro, so you look like the posters. Well, that's that's why that's why I've, I've never had the chance to grow a beard, and mm. uh, because I've, you've always been on stage, you've got to look your best as such. So I kind of thought, you know what? If I'm not if I'm not on stage for a while, I'm going to use this time to become a proper man and grow a beard. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, but it, the, the moment we're back, it's it is gone. It is driving me insane, to be fair. But I'm committed to it now. So I'm committed to it. Oh dear. If I if I let mine grow too long, I'd have to be committed. It just, <laughs> it just sends me do Lally same with me. Yeah. Uh, that's why it's it's shorter than it even normally is. Yeah. Because home cutting doesn't work. Take yeah. it all off. It doesn't look like you've cocked it up too much. Yeah. Anyway. Let's yeah. start, as always, at the beginning. This show's called Hypnosis Week, and I'm, I'm guessing most of the viewers and listeners will be hypnotherapist, stage hypnotist, yeah. magicians, mentalists maybe as well, uh, although there's probably some members of the public who are just interested who stumble upon this podcast or video blog. So they may know of you already, they may not, but one thing that will have all guessed is there was a time... When you weren't Grant Saunders stage hypnotist, <laughs> what was your journey to get into this? Uh, I, I took a I took a weird one really. Um, and not many people know this, but um, my mum was a hypnotherapist, which is where I kind of got my. Um, All right. I say I say bug for it, but I, I didn't really. I, I I didn't want to. I didn't want to go into that field. Um, but the mind always fascinated me. Um, so I played around with it when I was younger, but then went into uh, the, the club world, uh, entertainment, um, managing clubs, and then eventually owning a couple of clubs. Um, and I, I realised during that time as well that the hypnotic language patterns, hypnosis as a skill set, mm -hmm. benefits you no matter what you do in life. If you're in sales, you need to know hypnosis. If you're in marketing, you need to know hypnosis. If you're in therapy, you need to know hypnosis. No matter what you're doing, if you're interacting with people and communicating with them, hypnosis as a skill set is always going to do you well. So I, I kind of find it, it benefited me in the in the, the club world. 
Um, and then when I came out of that, I decided I'd, I'd had enough of it. I'd kind of burnt out and I thought, you know what, I'm going to go back to doing therapy and, and I'm going to love it. I'm going to help the world and I'm going to give my stuff out there and it's going to be wonderful. However, um, my ego, my personality, I, I like the attention. I like the attention I had in owning clubs. Uh, you don't necessarily get that with therapy. And I kind of got to the stage as well where I was in two places. One, you can get boards, not the right word, but you, you get to see a lot of the same clients with a lot of the same issues. Um, it's groundhog day. Quite oh, um, uh, without sounding terrible to, to or putting people into a box. There's only fat middle age. There's only so many fat middle aged women you can see that want to still eat chocolate, but lose weight and look like Katie Price. And it's kind of like that's 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 it's it's not where I was. And I, at the time, I think I was just doing it for the money. And because I'd gone from one extreme, I wanted to be like a super nice and save the world and be a lovely hippie type person. Uh, it didn't last long. Um, and then I got asked to do a, a a charity demonstration type thing. And I've, I've always done little bits of demonstrations of it at parties and stuff like that. Um, but I'd always had. Uh, like I was always microphone shy. I was always, uh, I always had stage fright as such about public speaking. It was okay being like being the man when you're in the club, and it was okay being the man at a party, but actually standing on a stage and speaking, I just had terrible stage fright. So I was asked to do a uh, a public demonstration for a charity and a talk, and I thought the only way to get over this anxiety that I've got about public speaking is to just do it. Um, and I remember the, the moment before going out on stage, I would have happily been run over by a car. Like literally, you know, if you'd have hit me with a car, I'd have been happy because I wouldn't have had to do it. That's, That's how bad severe, it was. Yeah. Oh, you know, there's no, there's no worse feeling. However, five minutes into that pre-talk, uh, there's just, I mean, you'll know, there's a feeling when, when you get that rapport with an audience that just, it just clicks. Um, and at that point, I was I was addicted. I mean, I still I still have um, nervous energy before a show now. Um, but that moment, once you you've done your introduction, you've started your pre-talk, and you know the audience is on your side, there's no better feeling in the world. And at that point, I kind of thought I'm not I'm not really I'm not really the therapist that I thought I was. I'm more the performer that I've always been. If you know what I mean. So yeah. Well, there's no, there's no saying in show business um, that, you know, the moment you stop having those, we'll call them nerves, or the, or the uh, excited anticipation, if yes. Nelp is watching, you want to reframe it, um, is when you should stop performing. Yeah. It's the old showbiz ad adage. And by the fact you nodded, you, you, I kind of guess you agree with that, but mm. somewhat... We may have to disagree on some things, um, which is fine. Because I always believed that. That's what I was brainwashed into until literally about... Well, it's certainly since my daughter's been born. She's 10 now. But I'd say it's probably more in the past five years. I was doing less and less shows on purpose. And I took one on. And normally I thought, oh, I'm, oh well, good God, it'll come the day and I'll start doing the completely nervous... Twisted stomach stuff, especially because I've left it a while. And I just didn't give a shit. Mm. And I don't know what it is, but and people screaming at the screen now, it's the clue, stop performing. <laughs> um, but the irony of it is, since then, any shows I've done, I'm just not giving a fucking shit. Yeah. It's either going to work or it isn't. Um, and because I think with hypnosis, it might, it's ironic, Lord. I still get nervous if I do a magic show or mentalism. No. Oh. Because something could cock up with me. I could uh -huh. fuck up the sleight of hand or whatever. But with hypnosis, to be honest, my opinion is as long as you actually say pretty much the right wording in the right way yeah. and look confident about it, it's either going to work or it isn't. It's the audience. And you can yeah. get a bad audience, and that's not your fault. I must admit, I, I know quite a few uh, hypnos uh, have some mentalism that they have kind of in the back. That if it's not going right, they'll bring some magic out and and finish the show that way. And I've I've never done that. I've always just had the hypnosis. And 
part of me has always said that's because I'm a purist and I just want to do the hypnosis. And if I had a magic trick, I would fall back on it. And then, you know, you'd give up on a show rather than do I that. I think a lot of them do, actually, in oh. fairness, because I, I know for a fact I've seen you uh, and a whole bunch of other people, I, you know, I, I know or I've taught or I've worked with, uh, especially in England, um, having to work venues where... <laughs> If you've not been into them, if you're watching this and you're in America or, or certain other countries in the world, you have got it made easy. <laughs> Even what you consider down market venues, bars, what you would call bars, drinking establishments that sell alcohol, uh, a lot of them uh, actually have a, a raised stage area in America. And a, and a surprising amount of them actually have what we call tabs, curtains, wow. uh, and, and decent lighting. Um, <laughs> far more than we do in England. Uh, in England, you can end up in the cor- stuck in the corner of a room, even yeah. for a well-paid, high-class event. Um, I, I did a show a couple of years ago. Um, lovely booker. Um, and it's one of those that the, the, the booker in question gave me quite a bit of work and mm-hmm. was like, I've got a friend that's opened this bar. Would you do a show as a favor? I'm like, yeah, not a problem. I've gone. And and you'll know it was like a corridor bar. Do you know what I mean? So it was probably only a couple of, oh, it was ridiculous. Bench seating down one side. So it was proper squashed. In, I'm like, where, where am I, where's my stage? Where am I performing? And they're like, oh, they normally do the karaoke. And they set up and they put the speakers on the seats there. And I'm like, oh, this is, this is, this is not going to work. And just as in the middle of the pre-talk, about to start the kind of call for volunteers, a lady's come out from the kitchen with a tray of like muffins for people. <laughs> Literally just walked, walked in front of me, and I'm like, I, I, I can't compete with sweet treats. Um, <laughs> It was, it was ridiculous, but a very, a very intimate. And and what you know, when you're in that environment, it's just, it is a nightmare. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Believe me, England venues, yeah. uh, there's a there's a far higher proportion of awkward layout uh, or, or clientele style venues in England, I think, proportionally yeah. than pretty much anywhere else. So now there's, there's totally so you start no let's go back to you know that's we covered how you kind of got motivated into doing this but then you had to I know you were doing therapy as you, as you mentioned but you had to kind of go and go right I've done a bit of there's a difference between doing a kind of public demo a therapist being able to do a bit of a public demo and doing a show yeah there, 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 there's there's a bit where it morphs. How there's a lot. There's, there's a lot of, um, and, and everyone everyone has their journey. But in in the UK especially, there's a lot of therapists that kind of go. I, I know hypnosis. I've been doing it for years. I'm a I'm a brilliant therapist. I want to market my therapy by doing a show. Mm-hmm. And there's a there's a even though they're so similar. There's a massive gap between being a, a good therapist doing hypnosis and being a performer using hypnosis. And that first show, uh, I mean, I've always been around comedians and stuff like that. So, you know, you all know you get a bit of uh, banter with the audience and some hecklers. It works. But that that first show was the thing that taught me, actually, this is about performing using hypnosis. It's not about using hypnosis to be funny mm-hmm. and, and and in the uk and i say in a lot of markets to be fair you get a lot of good therapists that stand on a stage and do effectively rapid hypnotherapy on stage which if you're a therapist watching it can be quite interesting because you go oh he's doing the the elman induction and he's doing the da 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 and he's doing this and he's, he's talking about that and that's fascinating but from an audience's point of view if you're not interested in those particular techniques mm. you're like this guy's just waffling or girls just waffling so it, it the majority i believe now is is that you do learn and you learn from those those venues you were just talking about you learn from those venues where if you look like an idiot someone in the audience will go <laughs> you look like a fucking idiot mate do you know what i mean <laughs> You know, yes. and and you learn to get a thick skin really quick. Your first shows, your first shows, it's the most scary 
but it's the easiest because you've got friends that are there to support you. You've got, you know, it's there's a lot of support there. And I think the trap that a lot of people that try to make that transition into stage make is those first few, first few shows are brilliant because they've got that support and they get this ego and then they go and do a show and it just, it catches them off guard. And nothing, nothing, nothing teaches you more than when it, it you know, it doesn't go right. When, when the audience isn't right, when the staging isn't right, when the lighting's not right. Do you know what I mean? All sorts of things. It's like juggling chainsaws that are on fire. There's so many variables you've got to be aware of. And they're the things that that, that teach you. I used to be dead happy-go-lucky. And I'd, I'd be dead laid back when I get to a venue. I'm not bothered about this. I'm not bothered about that. I'm not bothered about other things. And Alan, uh, you've met Alan. Yeah. Alan says, like, you know, you're such a diva now. And it's like, I'm not a diva. It's just that I know that these things are important. Like, uh, you need a good microphone. You need good sound. You know, so, yeah. So the thing that, that, that taught me that transition period was doing really shit shows. Like, you know, at that time I would work anywhere in any venue. And uh, to be fair, <laughs> if they've got the budget, I'll do it now. But, you know, that's when you learn that you've got to keep that audience on side. You've got to you've got to give the heckler a little bit of attention, but not too much. But you've still got to gain control over the audience in, in, in other ways. And, 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 you know, that's how you polish your stone. That's how you hone your craft and become a good performer. Mm. Now, mm. if I upset anyone watching or listening, <laughs> tough luck. I couldn't <laughs> give a shit. Um... And as I said, you don't have to agree with me uh, on, on on anything. Um, but categorically, I will state that the va- and this is generalised. Obviously, there's exceptions to the rule with everything. Of course, there is. But generally speaking, the vast majority of British stage hypnotists wipe the floor with the skill set and, and there's definite exceptions to that and i am going to i'm not going to name the bad one but i'm going to just throw out some definite exceptions it sounds like it's going to be kevin, controversial <laughs> kevin lapine awesome yeah. uh anthony cools awesome max there's a few there's a few there's a, there's a few others i'm not going to go into them all that fall into the really good category and uh i'm sure could come to england and god forbid but if they'd been booked by an agent paid a the fee that they were happy with and showed up at the venue and then discovered that although it was a corporate event, it was actually in a tiny little pub because there was only 20 major managers who liked that pub who were going for a major piss up. So it was tiny with no stage, no proper stage lighting. They were stuck in the corner. It was totally the worst conditions you could possibly have, but you're getting paid what you wanted. And it is genuinely for a corporate event so the agent hadn't actually lied to you. It's just the worst possible bloody conditions. I would argue that about 90% of American stage hypnotists couldn't pull off a bloody show in those kinds of environment. Mm. Because the, a good 90%, sorry, I've been upset, 90% of American stage hypnotists, are, it's not that they're shit, it's just they've never had to encounter uh really audiences who aren't already walking around as sleepwalking zombies as most americans are <laughs> not controversial at all they're the easiest people ever when i did on the hypnotist yeah. entertainment cruise that uh, richard barker booked me on first one back in 2013 in between me teaching people and all that I did, there were no induction required yeah. with those american yeah. people when they find out why we were there it was literally Stood at the bar, they're going, Will you hypnotize me? I said, I already have done, pal. Try and lift your hand up off the table. Yeah. Uh, oh, I can. There were no induction. It's that bloody easy. <laughs> I must admit, it's, uh, I've done a, a couple of cruise ships now. And it's, it's m- m- the, one of the first things I always say when I get on is, How many Americans do we have on board? <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? You, you can judge your show exactly by that. You know, uh, I, I more did one, Americans the better the show, yeah. Oh, absolutely! I did one once where eight, I think, eighty percent of the crews was retired Germans that hardly spoke English. Oh. That, that was a tough gig. Yeah, <laughs> that was a really. I remember the cruise director has gone. Do you, do you speak any other languages, Grant? And I've gone, no. He's gone. Oh, don't use any complicated words and try and keep it simple. I'm like, all right, cheers for that. 
that, yeah, but that was that was a tough gig. <laughs> was there anyone on board who, who spoke any German who could have interpreted for you? Uh, yeah, I had a, a couple of ladies that volunteered that kind of said that they would uh, interpret, um, but one of the ladies that was going to do that went under, and she was ah. the star of the show. <laughs> uh, okay. So it was kind of like, oh well, she's she's brilliant, so I'm keeping her. Ah. So uh, yeah, but I mean, it's we managed. One of the good things about doing, um, and again, I'm, I'm going to go to different places in this. One of the good things about doing the the difficult shows is it 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 teaches you and prepares you for the challenging shows. So you can do the the bigger venues and the bigger stages, and when it doesn't go quite the way you want to go, you've got you out. You know how to work it, and you can still do a uh, touch wood a good performance and an entertaining show in challenging circumstances. In the UK a couple of years ago, there was a rush for people to go. Uh, I suppose it's the same. It's more in the UK than America, I think. There was a rush for people to go to big stages with hypnosis. Do you know what I mean? And there's a couple of people that pull that off brilliantly. Um, but the problem with that is you've got, you've got to learn your craft a little bit before you start going right it's now 15 pound a ticket and it's at this amazing venue because doing hypnosis doing hypnosis as a therapist as a public demonstration is one thing doing comedy hypnosis in a pub is something else and doing stage hypnosis on a big stage is something else as well and each of those brings with it a new learning curve you can you can master this one and then the moment you go into this one it's like oh it's completely different I, when I first started doing bigger stages, I really struggled with that connection with the audience because there was so much of a gap between me and the audience. On a big stage, you've got right to the front of the stage, then sometimes some space where the orchestra pit is as well, and then the seat starts. So there's a different energy in the room. Yeah. So yeah, so there was, there was a big move from going from the, you, you've done really well in the in doing pubs, now I'm going to do a big stage. And I, I think we suffered a little bit from that. I went to go see... Um, I went to go see another hypnotist with, oh, it was with Chris Lee. We were having a night out, actually. Uh, uh -huh. I'll not say who this particular hypnotist was, but we went to go see another hypnotist because their marketing was brilliant, really good. Um, it was only when we got there that we realised that this was actually that person's, I think it was second ever show, trained by an American hypnotist, which you could tell because there was like two rows of seats. You could tell by the way that someone sets the uh, seat. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I remember. I know who it is. Yeah, I won't yeah. mention. Her. No, 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 no. And and the the show was there was challenges within that show that mm -hmm. if you'd have worked your way through the working men's clubs and the pubs and the clubs and the UK circuit, those challenges wouldn't have wouldn't have been as much of a challenge. Is the politically nice way of putting that. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone can uh, get there, even though it's kind of be nice. It's obvious what, what yeah. and it's true. You've got to, the certain things you've got to learn. Well, I mean, I've, I've, I've learned I've learned the hard way. I did a show, um, and it always it always happens when there's other hypnotists in the audience. Um, but I had I had somebody jump off stage once, and for, I was I mean I've got I've got someone on stage watching for people. I I was devastated by it luckily everything was okay but they'd been told not to cross that white line mm -hmm. everything was put in place that they shouldn't do but for some reason this person wanted to get off the stage do you know what i mean and it's kind of like afterwards you're like how did how did that even happen do you know what i mean but you learn from that and i i was very lucky that that didn't become something and it could have very easily become something else yeah so, like i say it's, it's it's juggling chainsaws all the time now for listeners and viewers to save you emailing in going, oh, no, that's completely not a cobbler's. Here's an example of why what you've just said is uh, <laughs> not true. Of course, there are exceptions to the rule. And yeah. these days, um, I'm talking showbiz in general. For example, it was only in the late 80s. Well, no, I would say probably very early 90s that in England, at least, that stand-up comedians, forget hypnotists for a minute, that stand-up comedians um, started to become massively popular to the level 
where they were filling several thousand seat capacity theatres, but then it went beyond that and they actually went to football arenas uh, with tens of thousands of people. Prior to that, audiences of that size for a comedian, it, it was just like pretty much unheard of. Prior to the very early 90s when Paul McKenna's TV show was on in England, um, anything bigger than maybe seeing a hypnotist in a couple of thousand seat British theatre was unheard of, but then Paul went and did the Royal Albert Hall with like five and a half, six thousand people and um, some other big massive venues. So there are exceptions to what I'm about to say because there's comedians out there going doing massive football stadiums, which seems a bit pointless because you only see them on a bloody screen when you're at the back of the room. My point's this, going off what you said, Grant, that about stages, it's a different dynamic. That is why people like um, Bob Monkhouse, people like Bernard Manning, if you don't know who those are, go on Google and check out the British comedians. Uh, both of them in the past, well, when they were alive, they said to me, wherever you possibly can, if there's a stage, especially if there's a fucking massive gap, because it's not so bad in the theatre maybe where the first row's here, you can get almost up close. Mm -hmm. Well, some venues, there's a big gap. He said, forget the stage, yeah. get down, get off, get amongst the audience, because comedy doesn't travel through gaps. Yeah. It's 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 one of the things that I say I, I teach. I don't teach people. I'm not. I don't really train. But one of the things I, I always kind of say is it a big stage and like a flashy intro and all that is brilliant in the right place. But if you've not got the numbers in the audience, if if there's a reason for anything like that, I'll I'll come out. I'll start my introduction, my pre-talk, and if you could, like I say, when you get that feeling. You know, sometimes you know what I need to come off this stage, and exactly that I need to come down there. I need to not be the hypnotist. I need to be the bloke, and uh, it's it's a massive thing that it makes it intimate. If you've not got the audience that you want, you need to make it more intimate. If you've got them, and and they're there and they're eating out the palm of your hand, then that 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 immersive entertainment is there. It's I feed them energy, they feed me energy. It's there. If it's not, you've got you've got to go and get it. Do you know what I mean? And it's a great way to break that that fourth wall. You go down and you talk to somebody in the front row. You in you know you you break it and you become one of them. Then so yeah, it's uh, it's 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 definitely a different dynamic on that on a big stage. Well, I agree with that's more important than learning the next. Super fast, guaranteed to work induction. Oh. Stuff, it? Again, we, again, I don't know if it, I don't know if it's a man thing or an ego thing, but like, you know, I can get my induction down to like 0 0.2 seconds. That's brilliant for other hypnotists. But an, this is just my opinion. An audience doesn't want to see that because, and this is for me, stage hypnosis works brilliantly on stages. I don't think it works on television mm. for the simple fact of it. The TV companies want it to look brilliant. So they, they, they filter out the best people, the best performers and the people that want to be on TV. And it looks too real. It looks too fake on stage. Again, my opinion, your induction's not got to be boring. <laughs> um, it's got to be dramatic. That induction is as much part of the show as making them cluck like a chicken or something ridiculous like that. Mm. I'm fine. Because of Darren Brown, people have more of an interest in the psychology of entertainment and all that lot. I find that people are fascinated by that induction process. And if they can see it and in some point in their mind, they think they can almost touch it. They can almost figure out what's going on on stage. It adds that drama. The looking and seeing somebody they know or somebody that they think is not going to go. And then they can go, oh, yeah, look at that. You can see his eyes twitching. You can you can see this. Oh, they're going. Oh, this one's going to go. And it adds to the the build up and the tension of the actual show itself. Whereas if you go out and you can do it, if you go out and go... Bop, down you go. People go, really? 
I don't, a, a, an instant induction at the beginning of the show is a great convincer for the other volunteers on stage. Mm. But it's not, it's not, it's not that entertaining. Once you've seen someone do a couple of instant inductions or rapids on one or two volunteers, that's that's brilliant. You don't get any more drama from it. If you've then got ten other volunteers to go through, I tend to find that instant inductions, when you've got groups of ten, take longer than if you're doing a group induction. So mm. it's you know for me it's, it's it's about that building up the drama of the show and then doing it that way. But in impromptu situations at a party or doing a demonstration then rapids and instant look look brilliant then because it's just on one person and it has that shock value like oh my god did you see that when you start doing it on a few people it it loses its impact and from the audience they can they know exactly what's going to happen this next time so yeah let's talk stooges because you almost um touched on it there anyway with regards to uh Hypnosis on TV, because let's face it, certainly in England at least, from time immoral, that's not the right word, but you know what I mean, um, <laughs> they're pretty much always advertised and filtered and almost auditioned people yeah. to be the volunteers to take part in shows, and it's got worse over the years. Yeah. Um, and even when that didn't happen, because I'm sure that Paul McKenna, for example, would totally deny that the production company had auditioned people for the hypnotic world of Paul McKenna. So I want to make it clear that as far as I'm aware, they didn't do for that. I'm not referring to his show. But <laughs> what I am reliably informed is that certain hypnotists, not just Paul McKenna, but certain other television hypnotists would keep details of people who've been particularly good hypnotic subjects, and I'm putting in the speech marks for a reason, during their theatre shows. And then those people will be invited to take part in the television filming because they would know that that individual was a particularly good, responsive, hypnotic subject, or as I like to call them, attention-seeking fuckwit who wants their 15 <laughs> minutes of fame. Because, frankly, hypnosis doesn't exist. <laughs> All you people at home who spent thousands on it, you wasted your fucking time. Um, yeah, um, so Stooges, why, why, I mean, why... why I think if they went and actually, and I, I don't mean in the way they film stuff now, because they're flipping, if you watch X Factor, America's got talent, Britain's got talent. The people there are seeing a different thing to what we're seeing at home as yeah. the viewer anyway, because the cameraman decides, I want it to look arty, so I'm going to cut to this shot. And yeah. then you suddenly miss the magic trick somebody's doing, or you miss the bit that you'd yeah. see as a live. But if it was filmed as a live show, raw, yeah. Showing the fuck ups as well, and the people who don't go under or don't react as well as the other people, then maybe just possibly it might come across believable enough yeah. to have legs for TV. I like in on a show, I like the people that that don't respond straight away or how they should, if you know what I mean. I like to see the person that's struggling with the suggestion. I do, I do the, the shoe foam skits. It, uh, it's Makes a funny it skit. more believable. Exactly. And I love the person that you can see and the audience can see in their face. They know it's their shoe. They know that, but they also know that they feel compelled to answer it. And you can see that struggle. I love to call them out on that. And I love to say to the audience, look at this person. They know what they're doing, but they just can't help it. And when the audience sees the person that's struggling with it, it makes it look real. When they see the failures, it makes it real. If everybody on stage was the world's greatest ballerina and could do plies and semi-plies, and I don't know many ballet terms, but if they can go into that perfectly and the great vocalists People go, it looks it looks too fake. Um, and so I do like to see the people that struggle. I, I, I understand why people... I, I personally wouldn't use a stooge. I, I, it would feel unauthentic. But I understand having, having booked, you know, my own rooms and paid for my own marketing and paid for a, a, a videographer to be there to film a show and then the show's not... You want it to be 110%. 
And sometimes you go, do you know what? I've spent all that money. It was an okay show. I spent all the money in investing into a video for that show, and it's not what I want it to be. And you think, but I, I couldn't do it because people would go, oh, yeah, but that's such and such and such and such. When it comes to television, the amount of money involved in putting a production together, they, they can't risk it not going perfectly. So I understand why they do it. It's just I wish they understood how hypnosis comes across when it looks too perfect. Yeah, have some people that, as with every show, you've got your superstars and you've got your cannon fodder and you've got your middle-of-the-world people. That's how it should be when it's shown on television. That person's a superstar. That person's not. Because it's one of the most common questions you get asked afterwards. People come to me after a show and go, the one on the second to the left, were they really under with such and such? Did you see that person there? What did you think of that? And that's what gets the audiences talking about it. That's that's as long as they've got that intrigue and that that you know that fascination with what's happening, you know it, it stays in their mind. They've been entertained. There's been some drama. There's been some cliffhangers. There's been some comedy. There's been a range of emotions that they've experienced, and yet they're still left with this feeling of oh, but what about this? And that's what you want when it's all done. When I do this, everyone's going to do that, and everybody does it perfectly. It's like you just playing Simon Says on stage. There's no, there's no, there's no entertainment in that, really. Mm. I'm going to throw this out there, and then let's hear your views on this. This is not so much a question; it's a statement from me. <laughs> and then, um, should I, you know, you said before, therapy stage kind of, you know, quite different now. In one regard, I tend to think of them as being pretty much identical, except that with therapy, your audience is perhaps one person. Mm. However, at the other extreme, they're different. That's the paradox. Yes, that sounds contradictory. Uh, in the, With hypnotherapy, especially on a one-to-one, and I've got to use these terms because they the, fit the thing. You are hypnotizing that one individual. With stage hypnosis, I believe that you do not hypnotize a single person on stage as such. You are hypnotizing all of the audience that are sat watching the people on stage. And it, remember, I said hypnosis doesn't exist. So what do I mean by that? <laughs> what I mean by that is that you are convincing the audience that these people on stage making a prat of themselves are in some special state so that the audience will buy into it and find it hilarious and funny, laugh at the right times, clap at the right times. So, but more importantly, so the people on stage, the hypnotised subjects, feel comfortable, safe and secure enough that they're in an environment where they're being perceived as though they're hypnotised and in a special state so that they can make a prat of themselves and know they've got the perfect excuse to go back to the audience afterwards and go either A there's two types of people, those that remember what they did and those that don't. Uh, yeah. And that happens whether you tell them to forget or remember. So your first type of person goes back uh, and goes, oh, bloody hell, did I do that? Yeah, I kind of remember, um, but I couldn't stop myself from doing it. I couldn't stop myself from doing it. Yeah. it removes all self-blame, shame, guilt and regret from them for making an ass of themselves. Makes them the victim you could say, but also the star. So then they're getting more praise and attention and their ego's being fed even more. Or they go, I can't remember. What did I do? No, I didn't. Did I? Did I? Well, show us that. Show us, show us the video. And everyone's <laughs> buying them drinks. Yeah. Either way, it's feeding their ego even yeah. more. They get the perfect excuse with us as long as the hypnotist could create that environment where the audience believe, the majority of them, that these people appear are in some special state, whereas in actual fact, arguably the people you've hypnotised are the audience into that delusion that something special is actually going on. Yes. There's, I mean, a lot of the crux of that balances on what is this special state we call hypnosis. We know that it, the word hypnosis is just, it's just a label that's put on things. I, I believe that i mean we're, we're always drifting in and out of different states and i think people on stage is they all know they're not on a sunny tropical spanish beach they know that 
they I, and I try and explain it to the audience that everybody on stage is aware of everything. Nobody's unconscious. They just have an overwhelming desire to follow the hypnotist's suggestion. And I think through the ritual or process where we're given the illusion of hypnosis, that helps, and this is more of the therapy side of things, that helps them lose their, their inhibitions, their social compliance about the things that they think they have to do and that that mask that we put on to society every day the process or ritual of hypnosis helps that move away and then the suggestions on stage i think when you say there's two people i always kind of say i always think there's three types up there there's those that think i'm not hypnotized i'm just going along with this you know oh, yeah well there's them as well but i think some of those are hypnotized hypnotized to a point then there's those that like you said it's an overwhelming desire they know what's going on they just can't help it it's an automatic function for them to respond to that suggestion and then there's those like you said that go full on into it and can't remember anything afterwards those are the ones that i'm not as keen on they're great to have in a show but it's those that know what's going on. Well, I genuinely believe that all of them can categorically, crystal clear, remember everything they've done. Absolutely. And they're, they're actually fucking liars, attention-seeking whores, when they're <laughs> saying that they can't because it removes, it just removes all the self-blame, shame, guilt and regret for them for having got the kit off horse. I think it's, it's, the, it's the preconceived conception that they've got about hypnosis that they think they've got to go, oh, I can't remember. When they say they can't remember, it's whenever I don't know what I've done, I don't know what I've done, I don't know what I've done. Oh my god, what did I do? I, I do believe, like you said, that when they go back to their friends or after the show, they get that second moment of glory of where they're going, Oh, look at this, this is you here, this is you doing this on the phone. So it does add another element of that ego stroking element to it. But it's those in the middle, the majority that I love, that those that do feel compelled. Now, that's not saying that stage hypnosis is just social compliance. It's not. I think that's an element of it. I think there's lots of elements of peer pressure, social compliance, suggestibility, you know, imagination. There's lots of things in there that make certain people, when all those inhibitions have been dropped to one side, that will respond to that suggestion purely because they've been told to respond to that suggestion by an authoritative figure. It, yeah. it, the, the placebo effect the placebo effect is not it's not real but it's very real at the same time you know people genuinely don't feel pain from taking a placebo even though the placebo is not real i think i believe hypnosis is the same it's a placebo in that sense but that doesn't mean it's not profound and effective but by the same rule, it's still not real. It's just words. But some people respond to it amazingly. And some people respond to it how they think they should respond to it. And I think that's when you get the absolutely amazing ballerinas and the people that come off stage afterwards and go, I can't remember a thing. Sometimes if I see someone at a venue I've been to and I've returned to and they go, oh, you'll never guess what's happened to me since since I got hypnotised on your stage. And I'll go, if it's a good thing or a bad thing, if it's a good thing, I'm going to take all the credit for that. If it's, a, <laughs> if it's a bad thing, then that was all you and it's got absolutely fuck all to do with me. Do you know what I mean? And, okay. it's, it, and sometimes people need that, re going back to a, kind of the therapy side, sometimes people need a catalyst to go, oh, I've, I've had this miraculous change. I've had this amazing, phenomenal experience. And the hypnotist is that catalyst. You know, it's not anything we've necessarily said, done, or touched them in a certain way, or said a certain string of magical words together. It's just on an unconscious level, they needed, they needed something to make that change happen. They know they needed to make that change. But if you if you spent, and uh, this is me completely overgeneralizing uh, and undermining real, real, you know, psychological issues. But if you spent so many years stuck in your house and you can't go out, you're agoraphobic and you can't go out for whatever reasons. And I am oversimplifying this. But there's lots of secondary gains for that. There's lots of, I can't do that. You'll have to do that for me. You yeah. know, I've had this issue for years. It's like that. 
And to go from there to, a, oh, I can now easily go and do all these things, there has to be something in the middle. There has to be that catalyst for change. And hypnosis is a great thing for that because it's... You use the word catalyst. You're so nice. I use the word <laughs> excuse. Because the way I would explain it is that if Dave, hypothetical uh, Dave, who's been stuck in his house for years, uh, comes for therapy or, or rather gets you to go to them because I always think it's hilarious when someone who's been stuck in the house for years goes to see a therapist. You're fucking cured. You don't need a session. You've yeah. shown up. Job yeah. done. <laughs> so, why, so why aren't they suddenly immediately cured by showing up? Um, well, because they're attention-seeking footwear to some degree or secondary gains, as you nicely said. But if, if they woke up one day and just went, that's it, I'm going out of the house, everything's fine. They bump into the friends and the family and they go, Dave, you're out the house. What the hell's going on? And he goes, ah, oh, well, I got up this morning. I thought, sod it. Yeah. En enough of it. I'm leaving the house. Everything's fine. Won't yeah. bother me anymore. They'd go, you what, Dave? If it was that bloody simple, why haven't you done it before? And he'd start kind of getting attacked yeah. to make him feel bad. So yeah. ultimately, he would relapse, as we call it in therapy, yeah. and end up stuck back in the house to prove that it wasn't that easy so he didn't have to feel bad anymore. Yeah. But if he goes and invests money and time and really plays the part well, rather than showing up at the therapist, it's supposed to be stuck in the house, scared, what are you on about? But actually, has the therapist come to them, really plays the part, and goes through an important seeming ritualistic process, which is cobblers at the end of there, to see <laughs> how powerful, great, but goes through a process, whatever that may be, it doesn't matter. At the end of it, if they suddenly then leave in the house, they bump into the family and friends and they go, Dave, what? what, you're outside? Yeah, bloody amazing. Saw this therapist, was recommended to me, uh, especially if you've got a, a really credible website as the therapist so that their family and friends can go, go and see it and go, yes, this person looks like a credible therapist. Dave knows he's got like a suit of armour now where criticism is removed from him for not having got over this sooner. Yeah. And they can't attack him and say, why didn't you do it sooner? Because if they say, well, why didn't you do it sooner if it was as easy as one session with that therapist? He can say, because I wasn't aware of this therapist's existence. And it removes all self-blame, shame, guilt and regret from them. And it gives them the permission to stop being the attention-seeking footwit that they've been for so long. <laughs> That's a, yeah, a, a, that's a, a psychological term, attention-seeking footwork. <laughs> mm. But, the, you know, there's also, the, there's also the, the, the ego stroking they get from that by the people then going, oh, it's amazing that you can now do this. Oh, you yeah. know, what I've saw. You know, you get all that coming with it, which is we all want to feel good. On, on stage, you know, it's, it's I, like, there's, there's, it's so easy on stage or doing comedy hypnosis. It's so easy to be shocking and get a reaction. Now, there's nothing wrong in the people that do that. It's just I I don't do that. I, I have I have done it, um, but I, I don't do it now. It, it's so easy to to shock and get a reaction. But I'm I'm in the business of stage hypnosis, so I kind of I kind of work it that. I want someone that hasn't volunteered to volunteer. And I want the person that's that has volunteered and been brilliant, I want them to want to volunteer again. So I, I kind of, I, most stage hypnotists do it, but the, the awakening ritual in my show is all about that, making them feel fantastic about what they've done, letting them tell all their friends about what an amazing experience it is, because that's just good for business. You know, if they're telling their friends what an amazing experience it is, how wonderful they now feel. And it's the same in the therapy situation with the agoraphobic or attention-seeking fuckwit. Um, you give them that that sense of afterwards, you know, you, you're now cured or whatever the word is. Um, you, you know, you'll take great pride in, in spreading that word, in telling people, you know, what a profound change you've now made. And it becomes the best advertising is word of mouth. So from a therapist's point of view, those people are brilliant because I can imagine there's lots of therapists that diaries are full of people that have done exactly that and then say that to people that have similar issues that then because they've had this miraculous, profound change, 
the 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 pressure is on them to have a similar profound change. So in a sense, it's not real, but that makes it real. <laughs> well, no, that makes total sense to me. Yeah. Um, okay, let's go off slightly a tangent. <laughs> I, I wrote, I have been making, I mentioned earlier I do this, and I, I write myself words as we go along based on what my interviewee has said to give me bullet points to react. There is literally, this is freestyle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think this happens with hypnotherapists as well as stage hypnotists. Well, it does. Um, why do you think... Okay, and I'll give you the therapist angle and the stage hypnotist angle. Sick mind fraud, Sigmund Freud <laughs> once said, most therapists are merely people searching for answers to their own problems. And sadly, I believe the largest amount of therapists out there, especially the ones that aren't barely paying the bills, it's because they haven't sorted out their own bloody problems yet. Yeah. The flip side of that is that over here, the apparently supposed to be all wonderful, confident, powerful stage hypnotist persona, so many of them, especially old school, and I'm not going to mention names for legal reasons, <laughs> are insecure, bitchy fuckwits <laughs> um, who spend their life obsessed with the fact that someone's going to steal their material. Oh, hypnotist, not loud in my show and all that. When who, who, who could fact, you be possibly referring to there? <laughs> at no, least, no, 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 no. At, yeah, least, yeah, yeah. at least six different people yeah. that could apply to. Yeah. Uh, when ironically, in at least four of those six people's cases, without mentioning the names, if anyone's lucky enough to get hold of a copy, old copy of the... Um, Robert Halpenshaw from Glasgow Pavilion and watches uh, Robert Shaw that predates all of them, a lot of them are doing practically the same act word for word with the yeah. same gags in exactly the same place, yeah. and yet they've got the audacity to go mad at other hypnotists saying you've stolen my material when they're doing oh. Robert Halpen's act. It's and There's two points there. I'll, I'll go to each in turn. Yeah. I'll start with the, the like copy material. There's, again, there's a big, I'm not saying movement, there's a lot of people that are trying really hard to be original with hypnosis. And I've seen a couple of shows, and by the way, if, if I'm not performing, I, I want to go see a stage hypnosis show. I, I, I love stage hypnosis. I think it's good. I brilliant. got to the point, no, no offence, because I can't saw yours, great. I, I occasionally go and see people who I know as a friend yeah. uh, for the purpose of going and seeing as a friend. But now, generally speaking, stage hypnosis shows to me are the most boring, dull as ditch water <laughs> events on the planet. There's a lot like that. Because even when the audience are laughing their head off, the good ones... Because, frankly, I sit there just thinking, what a bunch of attention-seeking fuckers. Is that the hypnotist or the volunteers? <laughs> well, different situations. You know, yeah. generally the volunteers. It's, yeah. I just, I, I know I made my living out of it for 30 years and still do, but I don't get it. Yeah. But, yeah, going, going back to the point about originality, I think, again, when I say that people should, you've got to do the the... the the crap venues mm. for the challenges, but you've got to do the old material to find, you've got to polish that stone. And I've seen a couple of shows where people have kind of gone like show number two, I've written a completely new show. That's all new material. And it's like, how can well, you do that for me? If I change a skit, which you look at, you look at a show, a skit is a couple of minutes of that show. If I change that one skit for a different skit, the amount of work that has to go into that, because it's not just the, when I click my fingers, you'll do this. That's not where the comedy is. That's not where the drama is. It's all the bits that go around that. It's the, it's the look to the audience. It's the slight smirk when you know you're going to say something and you know they're going to say something, which to the audience is going to look like that's the first time that's ever happened. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And then you're going to look and then you, there's going to be this double entendre and you're going to be like, oh, shocked. And then look at the audience a bit shocked when they laugh. And then you're like, oh my. And there's all this intricacy going on about this one little skit. And that's took me quite a long time 
to polish that little bit. And it's not particularly original, but some of the responses are unique to me. And just because it's me doing them, other people will do similar things. But that takes that takes years to get one skit to the place where I think, right, that, I'm happy with that now. I think to suddenly go, I'm going to rewrite a totally original stage hypnosis comedy show that's going to be 60 minutes in length from scratch, having no experience of stagecraft. I just think it's... And the problem is, is people then go and see that show and go, yeah, it was okay, and then go away and probably think, I wouldn't necessarily spend money on a ticket to go and see that again. Yeah. You can, if you see a film that's okay, the lighting in it is okay, the actors in it are okay, the 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 cars that they drive in it and the scenery is okay, you'll watch it and go, no. When you go see a film, you want to go see a blockbuster at the cinema with the big screen and the drama when the music makes your chest rumble a little bit because you come away and you go, that was a great film. And it's not just what's happened, it's how it's been dressed. A lot of stage hypnosis are straight to DVD or the late night channels on Sky TV that nobody watches. They're, they're okay. So it's about adding drama. And a lot of people sacrifice a good show because they want to be original when they're only two, three, four, five years into it. Whereas I think you've got to polish it. And going back to your point before that, yeah, like a lot of therapists, a lot of therapists have issues and a lot of stage hypnotists have issues. Absolutely agree 100%. I'm a stage hypnotist because I need that applause and people telling me I'm fantastic. Precisely, there's nothing wrong Jeremy, with that. And I, I'm not, I'm not going to hide that. It, it, going on stage is my therapy. Um, and I, I, I talk about this now, that like at the moment with what's happened, I've, I've, I've struggled emotionally, psychologically, because when you go from having that, I mean, it's, it's short lived, you know, when you, when you gig a lot, as you know, you go on stage, everybody tells you you're wonderful. You get that round of applause, you get in the car, you drive for four hours to get home. By the time you've got home, it's okay. You've, you've forgotten about the show, but it's that buzz that you get from it. I've given up a lot of things in my life. The only things I struggle with is coffee mm -hmm. and the stage. Because when you go from the, I always call it a hypnotic hangover. When you've had a good weekend of gigs and you get to like Tuesday, you, you have a crash. And it's because of the adrenaline, the cortisol, everything that's going around your body. When you've been on that stage, the fear before you go out, the feelings of elation when the show's going really well and that applause and that everyone telling you're wonderful and the, the tweets and the Facebook messages afterwards, that sends you right up here. And then when you're not performing, it sends you right down there. And I, well, I think it was maybe three weeks into the lockdown, when I was just I was just buying stuff online, like spending stupid money buying stuff because I needed a fix. I needed I needed a rush of some kind. So yeah, it's it's I mean I don't I don't drink anymore, but I know if 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 I did, that's what I would turn to because of that, because it's about finding that that high again. So yeah, so I I, I have my issues and that stage is where I get my therapy. I need to be told I'm special. <laughs> respect for being truthful i couldn't agree yeah. more yeah. um I touch on something you said which is the i'm trying to remember the exact word you yeah about the originality element i think th there's two two responses i've got to what you said one is that if there's anyone watching or listening to this who thinks they book together a truly unique <laughs> yeah. stage hypnosis show by all means send me <laughs> a copy of the video and i will give you as as long as there's actually it's entertaining yeah. if we were to ask yeah. i mean generally entertaining if we were to ask say 10 random people at least half of them said it was entertaining that's one little caveat i will I, I'll, I'll give you hundred thousand dollars yeah if it's 100 percent purely original in terms of the routines the gags and the way it's presented. Because I'll tell you what, not a single one of you on the planet is doing 100% no. uh, original when it comes to gags, routining and uh, content. Yeah. Um, because like it or lump it, 
There's no such thing as an original routine. There's only a twist on it. You can present it originally. Yeah. But you got there's a book called uh, Professor uh, Stage Hypnosis by Professor Leonardo, written in about 1918. Okay, predating you all before you were all alive or watching you listening to this. <laughs> and in there are most of the routines you're doing. Basically, yeah. if you make somebody wake up and become any pop star. Just because you might make them into Katy Perry and no one else has done that yet doesn't make it original. You're turning them into a pop star. Yeah. That is the bloody routine. Yeah. Effectively, at root, that's in Leonardo's book. Um, making body parts do things differently than they would normally or person perceiving it. The rubber nose is routine, although rubber hadn't been invented, but your nose is becoming stretchy and pleasurable. Professor Leonardo's book. I can find him in Ipsy's Bible, Delavat. So don't kid yourself. Nothing's new. But what can be is the order you put them together. Oh, yes, changing the music a little bit can make it seem a bit different. The gags you put round it and your persona and branding. Yeah. You can be, the focus should be on you as the performer being original. And Grant very much has got this. I'm just going to sum it up as I let him explain, but purple theme. A purple, I've got a purple yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, go on, explain. You've got to have something that makes you different. I think too many people, when they're learning, they hear this, you've got to be the hypnotist, and they take it too literally, and they become yeah. almost clones. Of a hypnotist. You've yeah. got to have the attitude of being a hypnotist, but you've got to be an amplified, show busy version of yourself. I, I always say, I mean, from, a, from a marketing point of view, it's always good to have a colour because what I want to do is, I mean, you'll know, on my social media, when I'm out gigging, uh, which is nowhere at the moment, um, I'll always tag myself at a costa. Do you know what mm. I mean? And, and there's a reason behind that. Anything purple, I always push that out there and always try she and tag it. all the Christmas party bookings. That's exactly, <laughs> yeah. But it, it's, it's, about, it's about, I want someone to see that colour purple and go, oh, that reminds me of Grant. I want someone to go to a Costa machine, take a picture of their Costa and tag me in it. That's It's good marketing. Do you yeah. know what I mean? I, I always say, uh, you'll see my hashtag. I do hashtag be the show. And it, it's it's exactly a play on that. A lot of a lot of trainers tell people you've got to be the hypnotist. And it's like, no, when, you, when you're performing hypnosis, you've got to be the show. You've got to add razzle dazzle. It's not the, when I click my fingers, your nose is going to be like rubber. It's it's everything you say and do before and after that that makes it a show, which is why you can see one hypnotist, they'll talk in a monotone voice and say this, da, 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 and chat, 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 and all hypnosis is self-hypnosis and blah, 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 and it's completely monotone. And then you can have somebody else that is exactly the same routine, but you, there's, there's a hypnotist, I will not mention his name, who doesn't like other hypnotists in his show. Um, and he doesn't particularly like me. I don't think he particularly likes anybody in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> he loves Americans for some reason. Uh, but I suppose that's a, a good business move. Yeah. Despite that, his show, I believe, is brilliant. It's polished. It's a great performance. The first half of his show, I believe, is just an induction. It's just getting them where they need to be. But it's done in such a way that it's entertaining. Mm -hmm. His stagecraft, the lighting, the way he deals with the subjects on stage, the way he deals with the audience. He copied Robert Halpin very well. <laughs> well, exactly. Mm. But and, and that's that's how it should be. It's about the performance that makes it interesting. Anybody can sing a song, and you get lots of people on karaoke that know the words to the songs but they're not Katy Perry they're not Christina Aguilera and what what makes a lot of singers good is exactly the same it's not everybody's got some some someone's niece or nephew that's an amazing singer that they bring around at like birthday parties and go oh sing that song and then the kid stands in front of the fireplace and then sings the song and everyone's like oh that's amazing and then as, as someone that doesn't have kids I'm stood there thinking like just please hurry up <laughs> but that that doesn't necessarily mean that 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 kid's going to be a great performer there's more to it than that the stagecraft and everything involved makes them the performer that they are otherwise mm. celebrities and i don't like celebrity culture but people that make it 
massive in that industry are the ones that do manage their social media well, manage what they output that people see of their stuff, because it's all about building their brand and their everything that they do supports their performance. And a lot of hypnotists don't don't think that. The amount of times I see, you know, some guys posting stuff on their Instagram or Facebook that I think that's that's questionable. If you're trying to go for a particular market and then you're putting up stuff like that, that that jars. You know, I I, I yeah. took down a lot of my adult material not because I'm against people doing adult material. It's some of the funniest material in hypnosis, to be fair, because it's so extreme. It is. I love to watch an adult hypnosis show, but because of some of the markets that I've worked, I I can't have that out there. If you know, I mean, I do a lot of holiday parks and, and corporate stuff, so that you know that doesn't necessarily work well with that brand. And it's show business. It's it's eighty percent business, twenty percent show. Think you'd less talk adult because you say. There's two extremes, and uh, and listeners and all, um, and and viewers, ho- hopefully by now will realise that when I say things, it's not solely for the purpose of blowing me on trumpet, especially when I'm making myself look a bit of a prat, really, um, because the simple fact is that you know I made fuck up sure in my career. Yes, I will admit it. Well, there are, there's, there's scales and there's levels of, um, shall we say, crudity, adult material. And it, I am not particularly proud of it, but the simple fact is nobody, certainly that's been covered in the media, has ever gone as far as I have in that regard <laughs> in the past. Um, let me make it quite clear, I do not do that now, but, you know... You have to put it in perspective. I was 17 in 1993, 17 years old back then. And um, and, and the world was a different place back then. Well, that's where I'm going with this because, although I was taking it a bit too far, I mean, the simple fact is to go on BBC One television and wake a woman up thinking she'd just been raped. Pretty extreme. Um, giving a stage full of people who are white... Yashmax to stick on and doing gay Bollywood dancers, pretty <laughs> offensive. Uh, especially the Trade exactly. Traders Association do where a lot of the audience were Asian. That's quite um, extreme. Yeah, you know, um the the child molesting father Christmas sketch and stuff like that. That uh, I haven't done since the mid-90s, you'll be glad to hear. If anyone uh watching this who wants to book me, um <laughs> probably best you don't, can I uh, but the the more generally accepted adult material, so you've lost your willy. Um, your bollocks are talking to each other. Your, your male strippers sucking a dildo, think it's in an ice cream. In the 90s, they were extreme or mm. perceived as extreme. These days, you see stuff worse than that before the watershed on television. Yeah, true. On family TV shows, there's worse than that. What I mean, what do we, times have changed, haven't they? What the hell? Where do you draw the line now? It's it's. It, I mean, it's a bizarre place now where I, um, you know, I've worked venues where I'm not allowed to use certain, you know, labels to describe gender on stage, mm. um, and I've, I've not lost shows because of it, but because of the perception of being a. Uh, a, a, a male stage hypnotist in a position of power. There is a whole, you'll know, there's a lot of stage hypnotists that do, you know, it, it does come across creepy sometimes. And I'm so conscious of that. Um, it's so difficult when you. You've I thought got, that was more the street hypnotist than the stage hypnotist. But oh, I, the amount of street hypnotists I see with pictures of girls in bikinis hypnotizing them. And I kind of think you're not doing anybody any good in that. But it's, mm. it's, I did, a, I did a show a couple of years ago in Bradford, a nice hotel. And I didn't know the girl at the time, but she she ended up in Celebrity Big Brother. I, I'm not saying who it was, but a very attractive young girl, glamour model, that type of thing. And I, I do the shoe phone thing, but she had a skirt on. So I knew if she was going to do the, if she was going to try and lift her leg up to answer that yeah. shoe phone, it, 
Don't go on the audience would have loved it, um, but it, it just it sends the wrong message for my show, what I do. So instead, I, I just did the whole, you know, shoe phone, shoe phone, shoe phone. You're not going to do that. L you know, looked at the skirt. The audience knew where I was going for it, so they could see I was being respectful. But you you will be crazy in love with the hypnotist. You'll keep it clean, but you'll try and get his attention. Do you know what I mean? It was a funny little skit. She was just doing the whole wavy thing. I think two days after that show, I must have had 15 emails from various males that were at that show that wanted me to teach them hypnosis just mm. for that. And it makes it it made me uneasy because of that. And there's a lot of people that see what we do as a way of Again, because of their perception, not the reality. Do you think that because if you can hypnotise them into doing that, then you can do anything with them? Whoa, whoa. And it's like, not not, not really. Well, you don't need the hypnosis for that, do you? Let's face it, you put a microphone in somebody's hand, poster up at a venue, and there's a paying audience there, you're immediately 50% more attractive to the opposite. Or same sex, whatever you think. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> hypnosis isn't actually the thing that does it. The, the hypnosis happens when they see your poster. Mm. You know, that's 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 when it starts. It's all that build to everything, like expectation and belief. So we have, we've gone slightly over the hours, so I'm going to start. Must me, yeah. <laughs> um, start drawing to a close with. Um, we'll, we'll try and end up beat, but first a slightly potentially depressing one. I, I've spoke to well, therapist and stage hypnotist so far. I work, this is episode. I've, I've had a mental block, so I'm going to look at my diary so I don't lie. This is episode number 63. Wow. Um, she's some going, because we didn't start doing these till the start of February um, 2020. Anyway, I spoke to Richard it's Nongard nice, it's in America. Nice, it's nice to know where I am on your list, though, 63. <laughs> I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only kidding. People, but everyone else is below <laughs> you from here on in. Um, we had Richard Nongar, John Saborn over in America, uh, James Zellis uh, in England, um, Dave Rawson, for example. Great, great hypnotist, Dave, as well. Yeah, and Ken. We had Ken Webster. Um, well, one of the things I've asked all stage hypnotists uh, and brought up is. Well, it's actually Ken who pointed this out. Uh, the fact that people are these days, compared to what they were in the 90s, uh, because they're addicted to bloody yeah. the iPhones, the devices, the social media and all this, that, and the other. They're so focused on that kind of thing. A, it's hard to get their attention. And B, they've got, they're less imaginative. Yeah. Routines that used to be funny then, they're not funny now, not because it's not funny, it's just because people are not imaginative enough to react in a funny fashion. Yeah. Audiences and volunteers need to be trained how to respond now. Most people aren't used to going and seeing live entertainment these days. It used to be the work in men's clubs was a thing every weekend and there's yeah. audiences with decent stages and, and all that lot. Now people just watch television or watch YouTube. And when you think, if you think YouTube bought people's attention span from like 30 minutes or an hour from a TV show, they're then watching stuff on YouTube, which was 15 minutes or 10 minutes. Now with TikTok, it's like, is it 30 seconds, 15 seconds? Yeah. People's attention span is like that now. And if you don't grab them straight away, you've lost them. And you can have, you can have a brilliant show, but you've got to keep working them harder now. Because if you don't, there's a million other things that's far more entertaining that's on that phone that they've got in their pocket. And know? that's only going to get worse. Yeah, absolutely. So what, if any, because personally, I think within 10 to 20 years from now, and it's 27th of May, 2020, stage hypnosis won't be a viable business for anyone. <sighs> Because of the way social media and the, the extremes that reality TV is yeah. going to combined, people's imagination being less, uh, people's awareness of the fact that, frankly, it's bullshit and just an excuse for people to make a dick of themselves <laughs> becoming more prevalent as well. All of these things together, together with, I hate to say it, uh, and I'm going to sound really conspiracy theory, but if you buy into stuff like Agenda 21, Agenda 2030, and the fact that Rockefeller documents... Um, show that there is going to be other events like this COVID crisis. 
we're going to potentially end up in a society more often, not necessarily all the time, but more often where the social distancing stuff's going to come in. Um, that will just essentially make shows impossible. Yeah. I, I, I do think there is a, there is a, a massive turning point going to happen with our industry, especially on the entertainment side of things, because we're asking people now that are, have now got used to staying in their house, now got used to being online and working. Yeah. People are less and less social than what they're, the, the people are so more antisocial now than what they ever have been. So I do, I do think that is going to become a massive issue. You know, it, mm. like you said, I, I do see it being a, a 10, maybe 15 year issue. But I mean, I I see audiences now who's seen a stage hypnosis show before, and it's people like never seen one. What what's a stage hypnotist? Is it like Darren Brown? It's like no, it's a stage show, oh. you know. So like I say, with, with with the demise of the working men's club and the demise of the everyday people going to the theatre to see a show, not a massive production of Les Miserables, but just people going to the theatre to be entertained. You know, it makes it makes it very difficult. The other side is, do we do we move what we do online? But again, I don't think stage hypnosis or comedy hypnosis works online. Comedy needs that energy from the audience for it to work. You need that drama. You need that rapport, that connection. So I, I do think we're in for very challenging times now. Yeah. And I think with with the people trying to go online, I know there's a couple of people that have been doing Zoom hypnosis shows. Now, for me... Well, they've been doing stuff where they're at home in their country. Yeah. And hypnotise people over Zoom, which you can do quite safely for therapy. Where you have somebody sat in a chair, you lay everything out, you put all your stuff in advance about if the internet goes down, they'll naturally come around. I'm not going to go into the way, but there is safe, ethical, legal ways where you will still be covered by your insurance, assuming you tell them to, to do therapy, okay? Yeah. The therapist watching for stage hypnosis entertainment content i'm sorry that the, there is a safe way to do it over zoom i am I'm, I'm not going to go into what it is but i'll tell you this the reason i won't waste my time telling you how to do it is because it would be fucking boring yeah yeah uh part of stage hypnosis is people being animated um and the only way to do that safely is for you as the hypnotist to be physically present with them so that you can pay 100 percent attention to health and safety yeah because while they're dancing like alvis they may not meant to have fallen over but they could slip fall over hit their head if you're there as a stage hypnotist you see them slipping you can dive and i've had to do it in the past you can get your hand in the way and knock the chair out of the way and you Disaster don't know averted. you don't know what's on their living room floor where their cat is where their dog is where their handbag is where their where their phone is you don't know where anything is all you know is you've got a person from the the chest up that's it you don't know what's on the floor and i just that would i think that would be the nail in the coffin for our industry and it's been a worry of mine for years anyway that there'll be another incident where the media jumps on board it and it just it it kills bookings i think there will be yeah uh, it's a matter of when. Yeah. It's been narrowly averted up till now, thank yeah. God. Yeah. I genuinely believed it was going to be one of the Fuckwit Street hypnotists uh, that was going to be the one who did it because of the kind of videos you see on YouTube where they've got them stood on the edge of the pavement, oh. putting them under, and they could fall into the road and the cars yeah. going past. What idiots. Um, fortunately, that hasn't been yet. But if, look, if you're watching or listening to this and you're a stage hypnotist, do not try to do remote distance hypnosis shows. Fine if you were doing it for a TV show where the TV show actually have somebody there on your behalf, physically in the room with the person, maybe out of camera shop. So it looks like what health and safety and all that's paid attention to, but don't do it for real because sooner or later, yes, hypnosis itself is fundamentally safe, but all it takes is for the person to slip off the chair, slip over, stand on something, or or, or, or be a totally attention-seeking footwit. Oh, I was just about to say that. And you can find yourself getting accused of having 
psychologically harm them. Media story, media don't give a toss about truth or reality. They'll just go with the story. You know, in the 90s, they said a woman died several hours after a stage hypnosis show, yeah. and that was the headlines. A few years later, when the government completely, having done the Home Office report, said that hypnosis played a zero part yeah. whatsoever in her death, zero part whatsoever, that made a little matchbox hidden in some page somewhere inside. When it was, was stage hypnosis the cause? Campaign against stage hypnotists. Yeah. Hypnosis kills. That was front page and double page spreads. It was TV talk shows. It was scaring the mass media. It's, and uh, a lot of you who hate me, by the way, you'll be listening or watching this uh, out of interest. A lot of you who hate me, you just think you hate me because you think that I was the cause of all that negative publicity in the 90s. But actually go and do some research into somebody called Andrew Vincent, who was a postman and part-time hypnotist, do some research and see that actually he, unfortunately, is handling of it, hyped up the uh, media negative publicity, and I just got the frigging blame because the news at 10 and stuff were going, woman dies after hypnosis show, bong, and then showing clips of me on stage. <laughs> There's venues in that town that still refuse to have anything to do with hypnosis shows. Leyland, Preston. Yeah. 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 I mean, I've done the odd show there over the years and the council have kicked up the shits because they won't grant a license. Yeah. Number 52, it misses them out, but I just use section five that it's for scientific and research purposes only. Get everyone to fill in a questionnaire. And when they argue the toss going, you've got to prove it's research, I just go... Look on Amazon, I've got 24 books out based on my, uh, you know, experiences of doing this with people. I need to write the next book. And there's heck all they can do. That's what a fast the... I mean, I, I mean, I always encourage people, most councils, um, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff about that, but I think with most councils you can work with them. But if you can't work with them, there is, there's ways around it. Uh, 30 years, thousands of shows, <laughs> two licenses I've ever had. Oh, well, you're fortunate. In that I, I'm just going to say, I've never been turned down for a license, despite yeah. rumours on the internet. The only reason I've only ever had two licences is because, one, the venue I was hiring, a theatre, wouldn't let me do it for research scientific purposes. And the other one, the venue, uh, the council contacted them and went, we're not letting the show go ahead without you having a doctor in the audience that I had to pay for. And um, going through all the licensing thing, which I did, I just I generally can't be asked. Nothing nothing sets the tone for a stage hypnosis show like the, the St. John's ambulance people stood at the, <laughs> the stage in the theatre. And I'm like, can you can you put them at the back, please? Why have you got them at the front? It's a negative suggestion, it's mental. Exactly. It's crazy. I've I've had I've had uh, I mean I love hypnotherapists, but I've had hypnotherapists before coming out on stage and you can hear them go, Don't worry, if anything goes wrong, I'm a clinical hypnotherapist. And I'm like, What? What? So, yeah. <laughs> Negative suggestion. Absolutely. So, thank you so much for your time. I've got to tell you, listeners and viewers, if you get a pad and a pen and you watch this back or listen to it back and take notes, there has been some absolute gems of wisdom and real world experience uh, that Grant's imparted over the past hour. Oh, shitty now. Hour and yeah. minutes. We have over on the hour. Hey, um, Check out his website, link below. There yep. will, I'll also put his Facebook, Twitter, YouTube channel uh, and whatnot. If you're looking to book a comedy hypnotist or if you're a hypnotist and you do shows and you're double booked, uh, I would recommend you can give Grant a shout. Um, so my fi I'm going to leave the final word to you, sir. What... For anyone watching this who's thinking about maybe moving into stage hypnosis, you've given tons of great advice over the past hour and 20 minutes, but what, where would you, you know, what, well, yeah, no, let's, let's go to, I was going to say, no, uh, what would you me, say? I'd say if you, if you want to learn stage hypnosis, one, go see a stage hypnosis show. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I see loads of therapists that go, I'm going to be a stage hypnotist. Have you seen a stage hypnosis show? No. Go and see a show. Go and see five shows. Volunteer for two shows at least so you get to experience what it's like for the person on stage. Once you've got that, join Toastmasters or something like that and get your 
performing your speaking stuff polished and then and and do it and do it well and do it with a sense of pride don't think i'll go out and work on stage for free because i'm going to get like stage time because if you're a stage hypnotist if you go out there and do it cheap you, you're never going to be able to put your price up or it's a struggle to put your price up and if you're going to get heckled and going to get the abuse on stage and you get all the drama and all the stress of what could go wrong in a stage hypnosis show then at least get paid for it that's what i'll leave them with excellent thank you very much indeed grant it's been an absolute pleasure fantastic thank you very much Ashes. guys and girls tune in again as always for another edition of hypnosis week bye for yeah. now